This is the I Am A Mainframer podcast, brought to you by the Linux Foundation's Open Mainframe Project. Episodes explore the careers of mainframe professionals and offer insights into the industry and technology. Now your host, Senior Analyst and Vice President of Sales and Business Development at Futurum Research, Stephen Dickens. Hello and welcome. My name is Stephen Dickens and I'm your host for the I'm a Main Met Framer podcast. I'm joined today by a dear friend and former colleague, David Jeffries. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. So we always start, let's get the listeners and the viewers orientated. Mm -hmm. What do you do for IBM? What's your current role? And then we'll go back and we'll talk a little bit about okay. your career arc. Yeah, so, so right now I'm the Vice President of ZOS Development. So really that's the, it's the main operating system that drives the main transactional workload for the platform. Um, it's an operating system that's been around for, for quite a few years, but I'd, I'd argue it's as modern now as it's ever been. It's a fantastic platform with a fantastic team of people that I work with across the world that kind of drives this, this platform for us. So is that everything from development, product management, bringing that to and moving into support a little, just maybe expand? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we do, um, clearly we've got the product management now. We, we, with operating systems, it's very, it's very different how you look at the product management aspects of it. Um, we kind of transform in that part of the organization. Um, but yes, we've got all the development activity for it. And for certain areas of, of the product, we've got some of the level two activity, which is the support. Um, but traditionally and typically, a lot of that is, is, is done by um, one of the teams that kind of works with us, which is part of the main support network for, for IBM clients. So uh, yeah, we do, we do a lot of pretty much all the development. Uh, we get involved with clients all the way through though, um, whether it's on the good side or it's on the not so good side when things don't necessarily go as well as they should, but we, uh, we wrap ourselves around all those things. So I know you've got a long standing career in IBM. You obviously started age five or six to, Absolutely. to have worked there as many years as you have. But joking aside, maybe just give us a bit of a career sort of arc. When did you join IBM? What are some of the roles that you've done? I think there's some really interesting nuggets there. Oh, I, I've, I've been around a bit. <laughs> um, so I, I started my, gosh, it goes back to when I was actually at college. You know, the, in, in the UK, we had things like placement years. Yeah. Okay, so... I think over here in the US, that's internships and, and various things like that. Um, but I started with IBM down in Hursley, which is the, uh, the development lab for CICS, or KIX as, as we kind of call it in the UK. And I started there 88, gosh, 34 years ago. I was going to say, you might have been like five or six years <laughs> old when you started It feels that. like that. Yeah, it feels obviously. Like that. It feels like that. But, so, but I kind of started down there, and then I, then I went back down there after finishing at college. So I ran around with, with, with Kick. So I started in test. So I didn't really start as a developer. I started as, as a test, functional ver uh, verification test, um, which actually was a fantastic role for me because it got me involved in not only CICS, but also DB2, uh, QMF, or a whole bunch of products that kind of worked with the platform and with the, the transactional systems that we had. Um, then I actually got a fantastic opportunity to go to, to Montpellier which is our, was our large system briefing centre at the time. Tough place to have an it was, assignment. It was harsh, it was S harsh. Southern France, I mean, that's going to be really a tough Southern gig. France for two and a half years, and Dave, do you want to stay down there or do you want to come back to that? That was the toughest decision, you know, do what, you want what, to stay what, what I really want to do. But the timing was fantastic because the timing was really all about when we came out with uh, our CMOS technology, where we started to move away from the bipolar technology and we kind of came to CMOS, and, and we, we created things like Sysplexes and Kixplexes. My role was very much around something called Kixplex System Manager, which was the dynamic allocation and dynamic kind of routing of transactions around a very complex network of Kix and DB2 kind of subsystems. So that then kind of took me back to the UK. I did MQ series for a, for a period of time. I did pre-sales, I did services and lab-based services in there. And then I got an opportunity, um, but the lab director at the time was a guy called Graham Spittle. And he said, Dave, how do you fancy a role uh, in kind of deeper in MQ, but MQ development and then MQSI, the systems integrator product, uh, that which then became message broker. Hey, I was there for three years. I changed the product name three different times. All right, I'm not sure if that was my fault. So, or so that you're was... the guy we've got to blame. Oh, it's all, it was, yeah, it's all, all down to me. And then I think a, a really interesting time in my life and, and my family's life kind of really kicked in because we got another opportunity to do an assignment. And you think that Montpellier was nice. So then they get to ask me, Dave, do you fancy going to California? 
for a couple of years. Well, California for a couple of years turned into 11 years. And I was able to do um, WebSphere application server. I was able to do um, WebSphere interchange developer and the whole process server kind of activity that we, uh, we brought a company in to IBM in the Bay Area and we integrated that technology in. And then I spent a bit of time in DB2, so I've done DB2 ZOS. Then I took another bit of a journey into IBM bought Cognos. And at the time, it was the biggest acquisition IBM had ever made. And we kind of helped to integrate Cognos, which is a team that was really based out of Ottawa in Canada. And we integrated them in around business intelligence and business analytics. Um, then, cut a long story short, another opportunity to go back to Hursley, where I started to be the, uh, the director for CICS the director for Kicks the Kicks team. I was supposed to be a couple of years, that became four years, um, doing ZOS Connect. We started ZOS Connect, fantastic team of individuals. If you've been to Hursley, you know Hursley, it's you know what it's like. It, it, it's, it's still the it's UK, again a it's a not Montpellier, but it's, it's probably the nicest office But you're not, look, you're not looking out of your window to, you know, to freeways and motorways, etc. You're looking out of your window and you've got cows and trees and sheep. And, and a you've cricket got, pitch. And yeah. a cricket pitch and a pub down the right. Mm -hmm. All right, I mean, what? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a bad place to go and there spend is, a bit of time. So much design of the Kicks, uh, the Kicks product, etc. has been done down at the pub on the back of a beer mat. You shouldn't say that to I, camera. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's a fantastic thing. It's so I think one, one thing that comes out, and I get a wonderful opportunity with these types of yeah. interviews, to speak to execs like yeah. you. We just had a session with Jose Castano. Right. And I think from the outside looking in, you would look at it and go, how do you build a career on one platform for 34 years? And I think just listening to you describe it there, you've been able to do so much different parts of the world, IBM's taken you around the world, they've taken you through multiple different products. What would you be saying, looking to you, sort of, you have the chance to go back to that kid who's just finishing sort of college, what would you be saying, what would the advice be? That's a good question. I think if, if I had the ability to go back, and, and I do some mentoring with, with college kids, etc., mm -hmm. certainly out of, out of Sheffield University, which is my, my alumni, and I realize talking to them that they, are, they have so much to learn. They have so much to know and to learn from essentially what happens in kind of the ecosystem and the environment of college to really what happens in the, in the real world. And being aware, being, studying technology and studying the news and studying the directions, the conversations we're having with these guys is, is opening up their eyes in, in things like blockchain and enterprise systems and security and secure development. There are so many areas, and of course now from an AI perspective, we're all getting heavily into AI and bringing AI to the platform and bringing AI to the transactional environment. There is just so much opportunity. And I think I've always said that, that IBM is like one of the greatest kind of playpens in the world. All right. There is so much technology you can play around with. There is so much you can do, whether you're working with research, whether you're working with the hardware development, the chip designers, etc., or whether you're working in the operating system or up the stack. There is so much you can get involved in, whether you're mobile, blockchain, um, cloud-based, AI-based, whatever. You know, pretty much every aspect of the way that technology is moving forward these days is available within the IBM development labs and in research. And I think we're lucky, certainly within our platform, that we're starting to touch every single aspect of that now. And so uh, you could say five or ten years ago, um, some of the open source activity and new languages and things like Python and Go, etc., was, was it appropriate to the mainframe? Well, now, now it's starting to be very appropriate. And now we have it. And that's, I mean, thank you for wearing the um, open mainframe what piece. It was. Yeah, well, I was. I, Little known fact, I was involved in doing the logo design back when we launched the project, so I get to claim a bit of that. So it's nice to see it on a T-shirt. But you talked about open source there. Give us a view. That's, I mean, if you'd have gone back maybe five years and you'd have said that there'd been an open source within ZOS, I think there'd have been a revolt. People would have seen that as something was really tough. But we've seen the open mainframe project mature. Mm. We've obviously seen Zoe mature over the last three years or so. You're obviously leading a lot of that from a development effort point of view. Give us a perspective there. I, I think open source has always always been something that we've we've probably aspired to try and leverage and capture within the platform. 
But the platform that we have is inherently secure, it's reliable, it's resilient, it has all the abilities that, that, you know, that we, we, we pride ourselves on. And open source, introducing open source into the platform has probably been to a certain extent, let's do it softly, softly, let's do it slowly, let's make sure we don't break the fundamental premise of what the platform's there for. And I think certainly over the last three or four years, we developed something called ZCX, mm -hmm. you know, which is IBM ZOS Container Extensions. Um, and that now is, is, a, is a very scalable and reliable and secure environment in which you can bring open source in and have it co-located with ZOS applications. We are starting to see a fantastic amount of interest in this, of people bringing different applications, Mongo's, Kafka's, et cetera, uh, DevOps tools, et cetera, into the ZOS ecosystem. You know, traditionally they've sat in containers on Linux on Z or other kind of environments. Now we bring them into the ZOS environment and ZOS container system. There is a word of caution though, um, as we all saw for thing, with things like Log4j. Um, open source has its downsides. All right. And so what we are now you know, clearly focused on is ensuring that we bring trusted open source in. We bring kind of curated open source and reliable open source. Open source has a terrific amount of potential for us, but there is also that risk. We just, we have to manage. You've got to, to balance, you've got to yeah, balance the rapid speed of innovation with, as you say, what the platform's known for, what absolutely. its capabilities around security, reliability, availability. You can't be putting any of that at risk we can't. to get harness that innovation. So it's genuinely a blend I see. We can't do that and we won't do that. We won't compromise the platform and we won't compromise the value that clients what they trust us for. But you've, on the other hand, you've got to tap into the speed of innovation and some of those other, particularly some things like the AI and ML that are coming with Telema, I would assume. Yeah, and there's been some, a really good approach to, to the AI kind of journey. Um, Telem, the Telem processor, et cetera, is going to be fantastic for us. Um, but the whole ecosystem around things like PyTorch, around TensorFlow, we're not going to create an entirely new ecosystem for Z and for ZOS. That makes absolutely no sense at all. So therefore, we've got to leverage the ecosystem that's out there, but provide it access to the platform in a trusted and secure way. And that's what we've done through the development of things like deep learning compilers and Onyx, et cetera. The Onyx environment is allowing people to bring um, models, AI models, to the platform in a consistent, coherent, and, and fully knowledgeable way but into, into the platform that really is now going to unleash that. And I think we've, we've sort of painted a good picture there of the sort of three to five year history. We're at a really what I think is pivotal moment for the mainframe with the new box coming and tell them and some of the things that are going on with AI and ML and the ecosystem. Final question, if we're at this exciting time, where do you see us three to five years out from now? Get, a, get away from Z60. Right. Maybe look a little out from what's on the product roadmap that you've got certainty around. Where do you see us longer term? I, I see the, you know, the world's our oyster to a certain extent. And I think anybody who invests and commits and, and kind of new developers coming to the platform has a plethora of tools that they can now use. And where will we be in three, five years' time? I hope even more vibrant than we are today. But what will that ultimately look like? Because we bring in all these tools, I think that can be whatever we want it to be. And it can be whatever our fantastic engineers can create and whatever they can build and whatever they can mash together and whatever they can ultimately unleash this platform to do in the next wave. It's about around security. It'll be more around quantum safe encryption. It'll be more around kind of compliance. It'll be more around AI. And if we get it right, if we get it right, all those new technologies will further unleash the common applications and trusted applications people have today on the platform. It'll augment, it'll add value, and I think, you know, I think, I think the future is very, very bright for us. I don't think I can say it better. Dave, thank you for joining us. Pr really good to be back in person. You've been listening to the I'm a Mainframer podcast. We'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to I Am a Mainframer. Liked what you heard? Subscribe to get every episode or watch us online at openmainframeproject.org. Until next time, this is the I Am A Mainframer podcast. Insights for today's mainframe professionals.